Good evening, fellow comrade. Comrade Kartoshka here. I am back. I have found my way to my special garage in my favorite car. Well, maybe favorite. Favorite car is still the Exocet, I think I said in the last video. But uh, anyways, I'm back here working on this thing again tonight. Um, I apologize for the lack of content. I'm working on three simultaneous videos uh, that are going to be published over the next couple days. Um, two of them have long cure times involved in, in some of the processes that I'm going over. Uh, so there's just a delay in filming, processing, editing, and, and all of that. Uh, also, it turns out when you rent a dumpster, you have a finite amount of time to put crap in said dumpster. Uh, I knew that, but I forgot about it. And uh, I've spent the last week and a half, two weeks filling up that dumpster, but that thing is full and it is on its way out. Um, I know it doesn't look like it because there's still a lot of crap here, but there's a lot of crap that's gone too. So, a-okay. Um, in that time, the lack of energy combined with the blistering 85 degree days and 85 plus percent humidity that we've been, that has been bequeathed upon us here in Connecticut in mid-June, uh, I have, I've finalized design decisions on this car, which some of you have figured out I am calling the 248Z, uh, mostly because it's a 240Z and I'm putting a 4.8 in it. So you combine the two and logically you would have a 288, but since it's a 240, it's a 248. Uh, math or something. Finalize the remainder of the design for it down to fuel system, all the auxiliaries, the, the peripherals, 100% um, what I want to do with the interior. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go over those as I get to each of them. Uh, I, I finally made the decision after doing a ton of reading and research to go with a fuel cell for the car. Uh, so we are going to be addressing that when we, when we get back to the end of the car. Um, for those of you who are now cringing because I said fuel cell, uh, and for those who don't know any better, this car with the twin carbs originally had a mechanical fuel pump. And mechanical fuel pumps are uh, typically low pressure systems. They operate anywhere between 5 and 11 PSI, depending on the flow and the volume and, and what you need. Uh, anything more than that, and you just you bleed through the carbs. So uh, carburetors work by using a venturi due to, I believe it's a Bernoulli effect, to atomize the fuel through tiny little nozzles um, as the engine is sucking the air in. So uh, effectively the, the vacuum that the engine creates atomizes the fuel as it is dispensed from the jet and, and that is how you make bang, boom, hiss, pop, whatever the order is of the four strokes. Uh, on a fuel injected car, it relies on fuel pressure to atomize the molecules into the air and to, to blend properly. And that's where the, the drastic increase in efficiency comes from, in throttle response time, uh, in, in fuel control, and all of the things that we love about fuel injection over carburetors. Why that matters, a car that came with a carburetor from the factory has a fuel tank that was literally just for holding fuel. There's typically no baffling in it. There's typically... Uh, there's, there's typically no mat, there's typically no structure to it. It's literally a, a Tupperware for fuel, if you will. Um, why that matters and why it's possible is that carburetors have bowls on them and the bowls serve as reservoirs essentially for the fuel injection system. Uh, in a actual fuel injection, fuel injected car or an electric fuel injection or mechanical fuel injection for that matter, there's typically no reservoir. So the, the gas tanks on those, on those cars have uh, a baffle or a uh, hydromat or something that can retain constant fuel level in the fuel tank when the level drops. So that when you go around a corner, all the fuel sloshes to the side, everything that stays in that baffle is still accessible for the pump to pick up. Um, this car does not have that. The solution is to either put a hydromat in and an intake fuel pump and do a bunch of work to it, uh, or I could not bastardize uh, an increasingly rare fuel tank and put a fuel cell in it that accomplishes all that need with a low sump and, and all of the, the stuff that we need to make sure that we don't starve for fuel. Um, so <laughs> long story short, we're going with the fuel cell. Other things that I've determined, um, I've ordered two sets of exhaust manifolds because I'm not sure which one is gonna fit. I've done a ton of measuring and um, I think I'm going to end up with some sort of modified, bastardized version of the both of them, um, which, I mean, it'll be fun. It'll be fun to make something new again. I actually like doing that kind of fabrication work. Uh, floors, 
really don't care about them. Oh, by the way, we're going to be doing some more floors tonight, so really don't care about them. Um, care for them. I care about them. I like having my feet suspended over the road on something that's solid. Uh, I just don't like doing floor pans. I cut sheet metal on body. Great. Floor pans. Choice words. Choice words. Top men. Top men. Uh, other things that I have finalized, um, I'm going to be going down kind of a wonky avenue with regards to the wiring harness. Uh, I've done a ton of, a uh, ton more reading and research, um, into the factory wiring, the integration. Um, I think I mentioned a couple of videos ago that, um, I, I found a way that I can use all the factory gauges, which I think is going to be a plus, um, I am most likely going to be purchasing either a painless or a BP performance or something like that LS swap harness. Uh, but I am also going to manufacture my own LS swap harness. So I have the full Gen 3 um, 2000-2001 Vortec engine harness over here uh, on top of the head gaskets that I need and an old Subaru intercooler. Uh, it has been garnished, if you will with um, pine cone shavings from my furry little friends that won't seem to leave me alone. Um, and I'm gonna be modifying that. Um, the reason that I am not going with that harness 100% right off the top, and I'm going with, uh, with a factory, with a, with a pre-made factory one is, is time, really. Um, modifying a harness like that to make a standalone when there's really no schematics available for the 2000, 2001, <laughs> On, a, on like a DIY how-to, um, it takes a, a significant amount of time. And my goal is to get this thing up and running, um, hopefully by mid-July. So it is June 9th today, uh, 6-9. Um, and I, I think that within a month, I could have this thing running in the car. Tear it all down get it ready for body work and then have the the painting done. I'm not going to paint it myself because if I paint it myself, it'll look like an entire bag of oranges, not just a little orange peel, whole bag of oranges. Um, I'm just not set up to, to do a full paint job here. I don't have the right compressor. Um, if I find a good deal on a compressor, maybe I will, but um, I'm going to leave the paint spraying to someone who's way better at it. Uh, I'll do all the, the body prep work, the primer, the, all of that, but um, I believe I mentioned sometime mid-August, we are expecting another addition to our family. Um, that is going to hamper progress on this build. Pretty good, pretty good chunk until baby actually starts like, you know, sleeping at night and stuff. Um, so expect a downturn in content at that point in time, but I'm going to keep going strong until then. Um, try and get as much done as I can before then, and then uh, pick back up um, when, I, when I have free time. Other news... The S30 that I picked up, the Series 1, uh, ended up selling the complete car minus a couple of components to a uh, fellow Z enthusiast, a guy by the name of Harold. Harold, if you're watching, cool dude. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hanging out for a little while uh, the other day when we were transferring the car from one trailer to another. Um, it went to, uh, went to a good home where it promptly got parted out and cut up, uh, which is exactly what that car deserved. But it's going to make a lot of Z people happy and, and um, you know, went to the right person. Made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So thanks for listening to me blab for like seven minutes, I'm guessing, by the time I cut this thing down. And uh, I am going to get to floors. So for those who need a quick recap, we left off the end of the last floor video with uh, all of this being seam sealed in place, tacked and, and spotted from the top. I put the car up in the air. And I'm pretty happy with the results. There's a uh, there's a, a small enough gap to close pretty easily along the trans tunnel on the sides. Um, the bottom's going to clean up really well. Um, I got to fill it with seam sealer and then uh, bring them all in. But I decided that before I do that, I'm actually going to do the passenger side as well. And uh, the reason being, my my scissor style lift, the, the drive on, it, it blocks a significant amount of the undercarriage of the car. So I found a way to elevate the front of the car while leaving the rear of the car on the ground on my lift um, that will give me sufficient access to uh, the undercarriage without having to fight around my lift. Um, and this is one of the downsides to having a scissor style lift, uh, but it's a small downside relative to uh, all, all of the positives. So I'm, I'm really, I'm not gonna complain about it. Um, but th that being said, I, I do wanna get both floors in the position where 
once I'm ready to put this thing up in the air and access the bottom, I can do the frame rails, I can do the seam seal, I can do all of that on both sides at the same time um, in, instead of having to play the back and forth hustle and bustle game. Um, so uh, with that being said, uh, I'm going to start cutting out the floor on this side. And um, music and fast moving pictures again. Cool beans. Welcome back to the moistest place on earth. Uh, it is 10 o'clock right now and it is still 80 degrees out and humidity is somewhere in the 70s. Um, I literally feel every part of me sticking to myself right now and what I just cleaned out makes it a hundred times worse. So I am going to cut this short but on good news. Um, so it, <laughs> you remember the passenger side floorboard was in way worse condition than the driver's side? Uh, that's mostly true. So it turns out that when I actually got everything out and looked at it, the physical bottom of the floorboard, gone. Trans tunnel, way better shape all the way down. A couple of high spots in the corners that I, you know, I knew I could fit my whole end, this, you know, this random spot right here. The amazing part to me, this seam 
all the way down, still 100% intact, still 100% solid, every single spot weld still in place, seam sealer was still there. So why this is incredibly good news is uh, I can now purchase a repop floorboard that will actually fit here without major modification, which makes my life uh, a lot easier. Um, I know that I initially said that uh, everything was too far gone and that's why I didn't go for the, the repop floorboards, but the, the cross member support and the frame rail are gone to the point where there's really not much left that's salvageable on the bottom for me to get good reference points for me to make my own floors. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it up to the folks at any one of the the Repop Z store places uh, to to uh, to stamp me out a, a, an appropriate floorboard, and then I'll make some minor modifications to it, um, which makes me really happy because uh, I I have a feeling that I can get it pretty identical across the both. Uh, I'm still going to put the, the heavy duty frame rails on this side. So um, the process is going to be a little bit different on this side, but that's also kind of cool because then I get to show off both making a custom floorboard and, and what goes into that along with dropping in a repop. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about that. Uh, things that I am not stoked about. Mice. Um, Previous owner of this car, I believe owned it for three years, had it in a shed and then had it in a Harbor Freight carport. And then I have no idea how long it sat in the guy's yard right in front of the carport. Uh, but I can, without a doubt, say that I found the most impressive mouse condo I have ever found in 14 years of wrenching on cars. And uh, I have bought some real pieces of shit in my lifetime. And this one takes the cake. So I don't know if you noticed, but about halfway through, I decided to put on my respirator. Uh, things started getting awfully dusty. I finally decided to take out the uh, factory heater core box, the HVAC ducting, um, the EVAP core box, and the blower motor. And uh, <laughs> this is what I found. This is the blower motor. Inside here is an impeller that spins around and pushes air either through, let's see, which way does this go? Uh, sucks air in through here, somewhat pressurizes it, I guess we'll say, and then pushes it out here. And that is what, when you flip your little selector knob and go one, two, three, four, this thing spins at different speeds, and that's where it goes. So as you can see, not a lot of airflow going on through this guy. And the story continues all the way through the uh, the heater core, uh, the heater core housing, the HVAC distribution box, along with um, the the you know some of the other areas of the the evap core box. Uh, this was not a factory AC car. The best that I could tell, it looked like it was a dealer add-on AC car. Um, so that box, I'm I'm not going to call it factory air, even though it kind of is. Um, also, not going to be going back into the car. So cool. So while we're here on the topic of HVAC boxes and how impeller fans work, uh, I want to point out something that's pretty cool. This guy right here, if you can see it with the contrast, this coil that's actually uh, that's actually wound through, uh, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that that is actually the defrost coil. And why this is cool is that the theory on how we defrost air in, in automotives has changed drastically over the last decades. Um, when this system first came out, this was really cool. Um, prior to this, I don't know when the coils, I want to say off the top of my head that the coils came into play in the late fifties. Um, I believe that the first car to have a defroster was either the Tucker. I think it was the Tucker, the first car that, that had a defroster. Uh, anyways, so why this is cool is. Um, that coil used to get energized, it would heat up, and it would effectively dry the air that was being pushed onto the windshield. You need dry air to defrost. Um, and, and the reason being is that frost on the inside is humid air that is cooled on the glass and frozen over time. Um, so you need warm, dry air to suck away that moisture and to, to defrost the windshield. Um, how we handle that in modern, car, modern cars, um, we actually pass the air through the EVAP core in the AC side of the system to dry the air. And this is something that you can actually experience at home. Um, when you run the air conditioning in your house, if you live in a part of the country that requires air conditioning, which is like, I wanna say most of it, unless you're in like Montana, 
Montana folks maybe use air conditioning. I'm not sure. Um, Wyoming. Wyoming doesn't sound like a place that you need air conditioning, although they have almost a desert there. So probably. Uh, anyways, you could see this at home in your air conditioning when you turn it on. It sucks all the humidity and moisture out of the air, right? So same theory goes for how we defrost car windshields. Uh, there's some other technology that has gone into it, such as coatings on the inside of the glass, um, coatings on all of the glass, actually, the lamination technology, the quality of the glass has changed a lot. So uh, there's a lot more that goes into it, but that's uh, the basic principles and, and fundamentals of uh, how we defrost the air in, in a car. Um, now that we went on that tangent, hope you learned something today. Uh, I am going to pause here uh, now that we've got it cleaned up and... Um, order a floor pan. So the next video, we are most likely going to be tackling the exhaust. Pending the exhaust manifolds show up when they're supposed to, that is up to you, UPS. Don't let me down, don't let the viewers down. Um, I have changed the design a little bit from the last time that I spoke about it. Uh, I'm gonna talk technical here for a second about it, just to, uh, just to kind of add some more technicality to this episode. Um, I did some more research and I appreciated the comments that came in on the, um, uh, on the video that I spoke about it, about the lack of an X-pipe. We have a 4.8 liter V configuration engine. Um, when you break it down and you go to true duels, you end up with 2.4 liters per bank or 0.6 liters per cylinder of displacement. Uh, the optimal flow for a primary, which means the, um, the, the exhaust pipe that comes directly off of the exhaust port on the head, uh, to the, the best that I can find, and scientists have actually done this shit, is an inch and five eighths, um, or, or thereabouts. It's obviously, it differs on every single motor, but an inch and five eighths is kind of the rule of thumb. So I'm gonna go from an inch and five eighths primary to a 2.5 inch collector and a 2.5 inch exhaust true dual all the way back. Um, originally I was gonna go with a two inch, which would have been fine, um, but the 2.5 inch allows us to breathe a little bit more, especially at higher RPMs, and I want this thing to sing. Um, so I, I didn't originally take that into my calculations when I was running my numbers for the two inch exhaust. Um, I'm going to try and get this thing to run all the way out to seven grand, um, 7,000 RPM, which, uh, with the upgraded valve train and everything that's in it, it shouldn't be an issue at all, but, uh, I just want to make sure that we're not choking ourselves on the exhaust. So I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of sound for more performance. The other thing to consider, and I definitely appreciate the discussion on this is the, um, the cross pipe, H pipe, crossover pipe, whatever you want to call it. Uh, what it effectively does, um, is create a venturi on the opposite side of the exhaust. That is what, then what is firing. So in a V configuration engine, you never fire two cylinders simultaneously on the same bank. So you get one fire, two fire, three fire, four fire, five fire, six fire, seven fire, eight fire in a V8 configuration. And those exhaust pulses alternate through the exhaust. So by putting a crossover pipe in, it essentially, it essentially, as this pulse is going down, it creates a venturi effect across the pipes and uh, theoretically accelerates the rate at which exhaust gases leave the engine. In actuality, it's good for like three horsepower, maybe. Um, and that's under ideal conditions with a perfectly designed exhaust system and minimal bends and whatnot. Um, I'm not totally concerned because I'm not just sticking a three inch exhaust on this thing and calling it a day. Uh, the numbers that I've run support optimal flow, inch and five eighth primary to two and a half inch collector, two and a half inch all the way back. Um, it just so happens to be that the mufflers that I have are actually two and a half inch, um, two and a half inch inlet outlet anyways. So, uh, it all works there. I'm going to do the whole thing in uh, V band, um, probably well, with the exception of the manifold to Y pipe, if you will, or down pipe, uh, connections. I'm going to keep those as a, as a traditional three bolt. I should probably explain what a V band is if people don't know that. So V band is actually two, uh, circular flat flanges like this that you put them side by side and then you put a clamp over the top and the clamp actually uh, exerts force on either side of the V and compresses them together. So there's no gasket in the middle. It's a really solid seal. 
uh, with the exception of the header to downpipe connection. Um, the reason for doing that is V-bands do not hold up well over time by heat. Uh, and I've experienced this a lot on my turbo Subarus. I had a bunch that had V-band connections, uh, pretty much turbos in general. Uh, and, and there's a significant amount more heat involved with turbos, but as a rule of thumb, I just, I don't feel comfortable putting a V-band, uh, that close to the exhaust collector because headers run really hot. And over time, the V-band actual clamp, um, they always end up rusting out, freezing, and then you have to cut them off and it's a real pain in the ass. So not that a three bolt style triangle flange is, is much better, um, but it's a lot, for me, it's a lot easier to cut some bolts off than it is to cut the flange off of the V-bands and, uh, and to get them separated. So, so now that I've babbled a bunch and we have uh, some more clear direction on this and, and I'm feeling better about the car for sure. I'll turn the light on here. Um, I, I definitely appreciate you guys tuning in. I wanna give a shout out to Eric, Matt, and Rob, who have uh, purchased t-shirts. Um, thank you for your continued support. Uh, if you guys have not received them by the time that you're watching this, then I suck or USPS sucks. Um, but uh, I also want to apologize about the whole link in, uh, link in the video thing that I said that I was gonna do last time. Um, apparently, you need to be a YouTube partner to put links in your videos now. And uh, my old account is grandfathered in. Um, obviously, I started this one and this one I need more subscribers to get to YouTube partner status. So uh, tell your friends, hide your wife, hide your kids, something like that. Antoine Dodson, I think, was the uh, the young gentleman that, that said those words. Um, stuff's going to go in description now instead of in the video. <laughs> so learn my lesson there. Uh, I also, in the FAQ... Uh, mentioned that at some point or another, I was going to be making a go-kart purchase because my daughter, uh, my daughter's birthday is coming up and she is getting pretty good on the simulator. Excuse me? Yes. One time I was in this go-kart and there was a purple go-kart and I won. <laughs> you were racing the other go-kart? Yeah, and I made him flip over and I didn't want to help him. <laughs> because I wanted to race and win. Uh, I actually found one. So it's a, it's a Manko, Dingo, whatever, you know, your generic six and a half to ten horse live axle disc brake go-kart frame. With your your every man's Predator 212cc 6.5 horse motor on it. Uh, needs a tiny bit of work. Centrifugal clutch is kaplooey. Um, when it went, the kid that was driving it at the time apparently hit a fence. So the, the front steering linkage is a little bit bent. We got to straighten that out. Um, I'm going to be modifying it to add a second set of pedals closer to the steering wheel because she is not that size. Uh, and I'm also going to be adding a, um, a secondary brake pedal on m my side of the cart because, as you can see, it's a two-seater, and um, I want to be right next to her when I'm uh, when I'm teaching her what to do. Um, so uh, I'm going to make a separate video about this guy. Um, we also need to make it green because green is her favorite color, and if it's not green, it'll be cool. But if it's green, then I'll be like the best dad ever, and there's nothing better than that feeling. Um, that will be a separate video coming soon. I've got parts on order for that as well. Uh, one of the simultaneous videos that I that I mentioned at the beginning of this. Um, as always, really appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, patience to come and watch. So recently I've heard twice that two people have binged all of the 240Z videos in a day. And um, while I think that's really cool, um, I mean, it... it, it it makes me pretty happy that, uh, that you guys find this entertaining and, and um, you know, it goes back to the reason that I'm doing this. Um, maybe take a break, get some snacks. If you're binging this right now, uh, chocolate muffins are great. Nature Valley granola bars. I feel like I should be sponsored because I just mentioned how smashed up they get all the time. Uh, Oreos. Oreos are also good. Um, Simply Lemonade, the, uh, the goat of lemonades, if you will. Um, that's about it. Cool beans. 
I will be back with more fun and exciting stuff from my glorious dilapidated barn when I have parts. Comrade Kartoshka, the Alt.